the Ten Commandments. Now, what comes into your mind when I say those words? Perhaps Charlton Heston as Moses? Our passage from Exodus this morning is the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments from God through Moses to his people. Now, Living Faith, the Presbyterian Church in Canada's most recent confession of faith, it says this in section 2.5.2. God has given us the law to show us how to live, yet we are unable to keep the Ten Commandments, and we do not love God without reserve, nor our neighbor as ourselves. Above all, our sin is exposed by the perfect life of Christ. Karl Barth, one of the most influential reformed theologians of the 20th century, he said this about the commandments. The law is the form of the gospel, and the gospel of grace is the content of the law. The form, the letter of the law, by itself is a hard condemning message. But the content requires a form, a structure to mediate that content into our daily experience. The law is like a cup. The gospel is the coffee. If you have the cup without the coffee, the empty cup just reminds you of your thirst and what you are missing. But if you just have the coffee and no cup, it is, practically speaking, impossible to get the coffee into your lived experience. Barbara Brown Taylor shares a similar sentiment, but with a different metaphor, as she reflects on the relationship between the law and promise. And about how much we might think that we like the promise better than the law, and how much we appreciate just being loved unconditionally. But Taylor explains that they, they both kind of work together because promise without law is like a tent without tent poles. Sink these ten posts in the center of your camp, hang a tent on them, and together you may survive the wilderness. Guard your life together, guard your life with me. It's impossible to really preach on the Ten Commandments in one sermon. So this morning I want to focus on the Fourth Commandment because I think this is a hard one for us to do in our modern context. Not that all of them aren't hard, of course. Yet it is the one that I think we also desperately need, even more so now in the midst of COVID-19. And of course, I'm talking about Sabbath. Verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Now, the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew verb hasabat, meaning to rest from labor or the day of rest. And many of us will remember a time when Sundays, the day that Christians consider to be the Sabbath day, when Sundays were pretty quiet. They consisted of church in the morning, a family lunch or a congregational lunch, visiting in the afternoon, and a family dinner, and perhaps another church service in the evening. No stores were open, no organized sports were played or practiced, no one worked, except preachers and music directors, and the occasional farmer who worked the back 40 out of view of the neighbors. But my, how things have changed. In this 24-7 world, on Sundays we work, we shop, we play sports, or we watch them on television. We do everything that we do on any other day of the week. With our busy schedules, our desire to spend time with our families, and our focus on having as much fun and free time as we can, we struggle with honoring the Sabbath and using the day to worship God. But even Jesus broke the Sabbath, didn't he? According to the rule makers. Uh, Jesus gets in trouble four times alone in the Gospel of Luke for breaking the Sabbath. And reading from the Bible translation called The Message, 
from Mark chapter two, verse 27, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't, mer we weren't made to serve the Sabbath. So what is Sabbath and how do we keep it? Well, the God who breathed us and our universe into existence said that it was good and then he took the day off. If our creator does not have to be indispensable and can take time off, then why can't we? The call of the Sabbath is to remember the fundamental core of our faith that there is indeed a God and we are not God. We are responsible, but we are not indispensable. In fact, we are not even terribly significant in even human terms. For the pages of human history have not left much space for the account of our own lives. We are one in over six and a half billion living people without even thinking about those who have come before or those who have yet to populate the planet. In the scope of the expansive physical universe, we rank right up there with grains of sand. But we are significant because God breathes significance into our lives. There is no reason for us to matter at all other than that God has willed it so, that God's volitional act of love, it gives us intrinsic value. The call to Sabbath, to rest and to worship, it is a call to be still and to get to know God, to wallow in the wonder of that love to remember that we are not defined or determined by the culture around us. And yet that is easier said than done. Our culture fills every chart of silence with noise, with music, with commercials, with activity. We are bombarded with distorted truth that enough is not adequate, that overachieving is average, that acquisition is better than imagination, that networking is better than building actual relationships, and that padding our resumes makes us somehow more important. Hearing and heeding that still small voice is no easy task in the midst of all of this. But hear what that voice is saying. The call for Sabbath is for rest, for redemption, and for recreation. Rest is the meaningful and sacred work of getting to know God and ourselves. Sabbath is a challenge. It requires a leap of faith. It requires humble confidence that the world will continue to operate benevolently for a day without my labor, and that God is willing and able to provide enough for a good life. Far too many of us try to cram eight days of work into a seven day week, but the Sabbath, it promises seven days of prosperity for six days of work. Sabbath promises that we get more out of life than we put into it. And the, in the surplus is that gracious mercy of God. Renewing the world, it begins in our families and in our communities with Sabbath disciplines of time spent together, of having fun, rather having fun with friends and family, that honors God. Gratefully enjoying the gifts of life is proper worship. Sabbath calls us to establish boundaries, to set appropriate limits to work, to spend time in rest and reflection and recreation or recreation and prayer. Sabbath rest affirms our dependence on God and on each other. Sabbath joy helps us to delight in creation all around us and reflect on, upon a God who created it and called it good. Most importantly, Sabbath reminds us that we are the blessed gifts of God and gifts communicate the giver we are cherished signs, the very image of God who wills abundant life for all. Sabbath calls us to live that way, not just on Sundays, 
but wherever and whenever we can make those moments, those times when we can pause and ponder and praise. Amen. Our hymn, O God, You Made the Sabbath Day. <laughs>